Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 93, which reads as follows. Yasasava parikina ahare cha anisito sunyato animito cha vimoko yasa kocharo akase wa sakunta nang padang tasa dura nayang which means Yasasava parikhina means one whose asavas, asava is the taints, it's one way of talking about defilements. So one whose mental defilements are completely cut off, who doesn't, who isn't dependent on food, who is independent in regards to food. Again, this is a verse about food. Sunyato animito cha vimoko yasa gochero, same as yesterday. For such a person, or or for who, it actually isn't saying what I, what I, it isn't exactly what I said. It's um, yasa gochero. So who's so apart from being unattached to food, they also dwell in uh, emptiness. The the liberation through emptiness and the liberation through signlessness. Aka such a person, aka se sakuntanang, such a person just like um, a bird in the sky. It's hard to know their path. Padang duratnayang. So yesterday it was hard to know their gati, which means their destination. But here it's padang, which means their path. So a bird in the sky, you, you can't see where it's going. There's no sign that it's going here or going there. It, or where it's gone, right? You can't follow it. You can't track a bird in the sky. In the same way, you can't track a person who is free, who has attained to freedom from suffering, attained to liberation. So that's the story. Again, that's the verse... Again, it's a very short story. The story here is about Anuruddha. It's an interesting story, one that I often think of. Um, in that in the, 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 the ideal for a Buddhist monk is to search for robes uh, in, in the garbage. Now, you don't find too much cloth, a cotton cloth, in the garbage anymore. It's probably actually pretty difficult in most places, even in Asia, to find um, cotton cloth or, or any kind of cloth that, that could be useful to make a robe that anyone's thrown out. I mean, stained isn't a problem. It's just to find a piece of cloth or enough pieces of cloth because you know, unless you're going to make a robe out of plastic bags, uh, our garbage has changed to the point where it's hard. But this was the thing, so Anuruddha, his robes got worn out and he was wandering around looking for cloth to make new robes. And so he was going from one rubbish heap to another, wandering through the city of Veluana, the city of Rajgaha. And it turns out that there was an ex-wife of his. His ex-wife decided that, or, or found out about this, and made a determination in her mind to get him uh, some robes. Now you might ask, how, do we, how did Anuruddha have an ex-wife? If you don't know much about Anuruddha, you might not ask, but if you know anything about Anuruddha, you'll know he, he ordained when he was quite young. All the other Sakyan, he's a relative of the Buddha, a cousin I think, and all the other Sakyan princes were, were becoming monks, except for Anuruddha and his older brother, Mahanama. And so Mahanama came to Anuruddha and said, Look, everybody else is ordaining. Every other family in our, in our clan is sending somebody out to ordain. So our family should have someone as a monk as well, just so we don't, you know, just to, to 
uh, for the glory, or you know, just for the goodness of our family. Mahanama thought this was important, and so he said, "So either you or I should become a monk, and the other one will stay and become uh, will stay and and become a rich householder and and a businessman." And he said, wow, you know, I mean, becoming a monk looks really difficult. I think I'd prefer to stay, Anuruddha said, I think I'd prefer to stay as a lay person. Mahanama said, okay, well then, in that case I'm going to have to teach you, because Anuruddha was really, if you remember the story about the nutty cakes, uh, which is a story for another time, I've already told that story, but Anuruddha was incredibly naive. He wasn't stupid. But he was totally naive in the purest sense, and he just had no experience, no... Uh, he had never been at any contact with hardship or, or difficulty. And so when his mother said, there are no cakes, he, he was confused. And he thought she was saying, all I've got is these nutty cakes. Nutty meaning, there's, meaning there aren't. And so she said, well, bring me some nutty cakes. And so now... He was. He said. He thought. Well, looking at how difficult it is to be a monk, it doesn't really look like something I'd be interested in. And so Mahanama sat him down and started explaining to him what he would have to do. Well, you know, first you have to gather the farmers together, and you have to plant the rice, and then you have to grow the rice and take care of it, and guard off pests, and and so on, and water. Make sure the irrigation is is proper, and then you have to mill the grain, and then you have to store it and then you have to bring it to the market and sell it and he went on and Anurad just said stop, stop there's no way I'm doing he, he was just horrified he said there's no way I'm going to do that absolutely becoming a monk is far far preferable he couldn't believe the, the sort of thing and so it's an inter sort of a refreshing look because most of us are kind of most people are kind of resigned to the fact well of course you have to work a 9 to 5 job but it's nice to have sort of an outside opinion of someone who hasn't done it and thinking, geez, why wouldn't I just become a monk? <laughs> kind of refreshing, because people think, oh, how difficult it would be to be a monk. And you don't have to work nine to five, that's for sure. And you don't have to do all the things that... I don't have to put up with so many of the things that lay people put up with. Of course, there are many other challenges, obviously. But Anuruddha... Ah, yes, so the point being that he had no wife. He was too young when he ordained. He wasn't, I guess, too young, but he had he had not a wife, as far as I know. But this was an ex-wife from three lives ago, and I'm not sure how they know that, but it's been handed down as... as uh, the, how it was. So three, what, three, three lifetimes ago, he had a wife. And she was reborn as a goddess an angel, Jalini. That's what it says. And she wanted to offer him a robe, because he needed the robe, and she thought, well, if I give it to him, he's not going to take it, because he's intent upon getting uh, a discarded robe. So she made this wonderful angelic robe, and, and placed it underneath a refuse pile, with just the corner sticking out. And Anuruddha was coming along, and he came up to this pile, and he saw the corner, and he pulled it out, and he thought, wow, what a, what a, he said, this is indeed a most remarkable refuse heap. And so he took the, I guess there were more than one, he took the, the, the robes out, or the cloths out, it was just cloth actually, see, and then they would start with cloth, and they would sew the robes themselves. And so that's what he did. He brought it back to the monastery, and all the other monks helped. So they got together in a circle, and they um, it says that everybody got involved with making him a robe. Anuruddha was just so well-loved uh, that they all got together, and 500 monks with the Buddha at, as the head, at the head, and the 80 chief disciples came as well, all for the purpose of... Ah, uh, no, not, not all. They didn't all get together, but they were all there. And the, the uh, Mahakasabha was at the foot of the robe, El, El Sariputta was in the middle, and An 
Ananda was at the head. So these three powerhouse monks were involved. All right, and yes, 500 monks along with the 80 great disciples got involved spinning the spinning out thread to sew with, right? They actually had to take old robes, I guess, and fi or take some kind of cotton resources to make thread out of. And the Buddha threaded the needle. Mahamogalana went and got supplies for them because he had magical powers. Anyway, this is the story. It was a big to-do. Everyone got involved with making these, this set of robes up for Anuruddha, which is a, an incredible image no, of this, this uh, harmony and cooperation with all these enlightened beings. And the ex-wife Angel went off into the city and got everyone to bring food. Uh, thinking, oh, there's all these monks and they have to sit, stay together and they have to be busy making the robes, so it uh, be good if everyone were to come. So she went in disguised as a human being and got everyone to bring alms to the monastery. But the point of this story and how it relates to our verse is that a problem arose in that there was too much food which is often what happens with these big celebrations, even in modern times. People get so excited that they bring lots and lots of food, and they really want to do good deeds, and so it's a great thing. But then what inevitably happens is someone complains, and that's what happened here. Turns out there was a great heap of food remaining over after everybody had eaten. It was just even with 500 monks and 580 monks, um, just too much food because everyone was so keen to help hearing that this what a great opportunity to help this auspicious uh, occasion I mean that maybe it doesn't sound that auspicious but it's a big deal when a monk gets a new robe and really you're clothing an enlightened being and so on you know not just any monk it's Anuruddha he was one of the 80 great disciples of the Buddha and uh, so there was all this food that was just rotten it went. It went, just went bad, and some monks got offended, and they looked at it and they thought, you know, this must be Anuruddha's doing. And they say he must have gone to his kinsmen and told them, hey, bring some food, bring such so so much food, and uh, be for everyone. And they said, you know, clearly he didn't think beforehand, and he wasted all this food, and and. Um, kind of took advantage of people's goodwill. It's amazing how people, it's just the same as yesterday, they get so involved with other people's affairs and want to criticize and attack them. And then, so the teacher found out about it and he called them over and asked them, what are you guys talking about? And they told him and he said, look, do you have any, any evidence that Anuruddha did it? And they said, yes. They actually said, yes, we do. Oh, no. He said, do you not think that it was brought? He said, do you really think that the Anur that Anuruddha ordered this? And they said, yes, of course we think that. And the Buddha scolded them and said, there's no way Anuruddha could do that. There's no way Anuruddha would be so attached. And I guess the implication is that he has some attachment to food. So he was greedy. You know, he wanted special food for all the monks or he wanted special food for himself. And he didn't understand what was enough. He didn't know what was enough food. His greed overtook him, obviously, because there's no way he could have miscalculated. He must have just gotten so greedy that he wanted extra food. But, you know, the truth is he had nothing to do with it. It was the lay people who were just overzealous and this angel who went out of her way. He didn't even ask, of course, this angel to go and tell people to bring alms. Probably would have had everyone go out and get alms themselves. But when the food came, so they ate what they could, and the rest, well, you can't blame them, they didn't ask for it. So then the Buddha taught this verse. He said, it couldn't couldn't have been. Anuruddha would never have thought such a thing. He had no, no such greed, no such attachment. And the implication is that he's rid himself of the asavas. He has no, he is independent in regards to food. He dwells in selflessness and signlessness and 
as a result. And this is an interesting, it's interesting how it relates here because it says padang tasa duranayang, which means his track. And here it's it's interesting because this could refer to his state of mind. So these people are trying to think, you know, Anuruddha was like this, Anuruddha is thinking this. This is what Anuruddha is like. And he said, you guys have no clue. You are not able to tell Anuruddha's train of thought. This is the padang. Padang means the tra his track. Just as you couldn't, if you looked at a bird, if you if you looked at the sky where a bird had traveled, you wouldn't see where which way the bird went. In the same way, you don't know which way Anuruddha go, is going in his mind. You can't know Anuruddha's mind. It's very difficult. And you people who are set upon criticism, yes, how could you know? He doesn't say that because he's not being critical of them. He's just chastising them and saying, how could you say that about my son? The Buddha would use the word my son for monks who were uh, who, who enlightened monks because it, not, it wasn't dependent on how long they'd been a monk or so on. He considered that, that anyone who became enlightened was his son. Through his teaching, if they became enlightened, he would call them his son. So he called Mamaputta, Mamaputo, my son. So the verse is quite similar to yesterday. There's not that much more to talk about. We've talked about food, not being dependent on food, which is, you know, in the sense of being able to even go without it. If no food comes, you sometimes won't eat. And that happens. I mean, it may have been they would just decide, well, we're too busy, we won't even go and get food. So today we'll just all go without food. They might even do that. They might not. But as it, as it often happens, there's no need because lay people are in touch with the monks and when they find out and everybody wants to get involved, they think, oh, well, we'll bring food to the monastery. We've got, we can do that. We can support in that way. And they would do that. But we have the first part that's a little bit different, right? I guess it's not that much different. What was the first one? Was Sanichayo, who has no hoarding. So yeah, it's quite different. This one is talking about one who has rid oneself of the asava. Asava is an interesting word. It it has to do with the savana stream. So asava is like the the, the outpourings. You know, our, our mind is contained, but it leaks. So asava could be translated as the leaks. How our mind leaks out. It leaks out because it's not contained. Our mind is not stable. Our mind is not uh, calm. So it's like there's an overflowing, there's a rippling of waves, and and thus there's a outpouring. This is it's kind of a symbolic way, or or what do you call it, a metaphoric way um, of, of of talking about the defilements. But uh, or it's an idiomatic usage of the word asava, but used by the Buddha is refers to th you know the, the meaning is that as I said that defilements are an outflowing, and when you cut those off, your mind is contained. That's the implication. So it means defilements, and by defilements, of course, we mean anything based on greed, based on anger, or based on delusion. So again, it's similar to last week. I'm not sure too much to say. This is obviously the sort of thing that, except that I've realized that the grammar wasn't exact what I was saying yesterday, how I thought that one who doesn't rely upon food is as a result um, set in the two kinds of liberation. It's more like not only do you have to be free from, or or in 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 addition to being free from reliance or dependence on food, um, such a person who on top of that is also, or maybe you could say in line with that, is also uh, dedicated to the two kinds of liberation, liberation through uh, emptiness and liberation through sign signlessness, which means they see non-self. When they see non-self, that, that adds to their the likelihood that they're not going to cling to food, you know, the idea that I want to feed my body or worry about or concern about the body. When they see impermanence, they will not be worried about or or concerned about change, you know, not getting food won't bother them. You know, the 
pain or the hunger of going without food isn't a deal because they're comfortable with experience as it is. Change doesn't bother them. They're not dependent on one, one condition. So in our meditation, we're going for a lot of these things. Someone asked me today about how you give up your dependence on food, and really it's like all other, answer, all other questions, the answer is still meditation. When you, when you understand, rather than trying to control, you know, rather than trying to force yourself or, or feel guilty about or, or get angry at yourself, when you want to eat junk food or when you want to eat too much or that kind of thing, you have to change to study it. If, if it's wrong, well then I should know it's wrong. If I really knew that it was wrong, then I wouldn't, uh, for any reason, indulge in it. So we have to study. It means that we don't know enough yet. We're not clear in our minds enough, so we still like and want. But when you study, then you see sunyata and you see animita. And sunyata means it's not it's void of any substance. It's not really a substantial happiness. Animita means it's not a stable happiness. It's, it can change without sign, without s signal or warning. When you see these things, then you you give up your attachment. You'll see, well, really, it is bad, useless, harmful, and then you stop, just naturally. So that's the Dhammapada for today. I think we'll stop there. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, keep practicing and be well. <laughs>